My name is Stephen Canvin, and uh, I'm the LEGO Mindset Community Manager. And I just want to tell you, uh, I have the best job in the world. Uh, I couldn't make it to be an astronaut, so this is the second best job, I, I would say, but this is the best world, best job on this planet. Um, the reason why is I work for one of the best toy brands in the world, which is LEGO. I work with some of the best sock brands on the LEGO, which is Mindstorms, which is all about robots. And adding to that, I work with the community around LEGO Mindstorms, meaning working with all the people who are users of LEGO Mindstorms. And I'm the manager of that uh, community as such. But since the community is uh, self-governed, they take care of themselves, it grows without my help, I have an easy job. Oh, that's cool. Cool. So I can control it myself. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Who, who do not know LEGO Mindstorms, um, we came out with the first robotics product in 1998. Uh, and we are targeting children this age, 12 years old and up. Uh, but what actually happened was, in 1998, a few months after we had launched the product, it got hacked. People out there, adult people, took apart our software and hardware and put up the shopping list on a website for everyone to see. So um, normally in a company like Lego, we would probably think about copyright violation or whether we should uh, attack these people legally as pirates, but we didn't, and it was all good. Uh, because a lot of <laughs> very sensitive. So here we go. A lot of things came out of that <coughs> because we launched the first generation in 1998, and a few years later, we decided to create a new generation of robots. Uh, under Lego Mindstorms uh, umbrella and what we actually did because we have found that the hackers out there all these adults they had much more brains than we had in the company to work on this so we invited these people to come into uh, our uh, research and development and actually help us develop the new stuff so this is actually a picture of uh, two of our adult fans <laughs> as you can see they're called a -Falls. it's a, a abbreviation they come up with themselves adult fan of Lego uh, we invited them to come into our R&D. Normally we don't let people in there like coming from the streets, but we took a risk. We didn't tell management until after. So we got, uh, uh, we, what's it called, um, we didn't ask for permission, we asked for forgiveness. But it actually came out quite right because these guys actually helped us develop a lot of cool stuff with a new product that came out in 2006. So this is the new generation, the generation we're living in right now with Mindstorms, the NXT generation. Uh, we have much more on display in here, uh, in the auditorium, in the gallery. Uh, but we had found out that our target groups had also moved, because not only wanted we to sell this to children, meaning boys, age 10 to 14, but there was also all these older children, age 18 and up, people like some of you in the audience, who also found an interest in building and playing around with LEGO and LEGO Mindstorms. Um, so, we uh, came up with the catchphrase that we wanted to uh, 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 offer this product to all children of all ages uh, who wanted to build and program their own robots to do what they wanted them to do. So, um, some of these people out there uh, in our community um, are very ingenious. I, uh, this is Daniele from Italy. Um, he's the today's Leonardo da Vinci because he's very ingenious in creating new models and new crazy ideas. He has made a Rubik's Cube solver. Uh, he has made machines that can draw like this uh, baby up here. We're actually showing some videos later on today where you can see some of these model and models in action. But it's just really, really great to see young people like Daniele who started at age 19 to develop and invent new m models. He's been writing up to three books now. And now he has his own brand uh, and amazing some really, really crazy things. Uh, like a Wi Fi module actually on display next door. And uh, here's some other uh, adults playing around, mixing with children. But this is uh, an American group uh, working together with. Oh, very sensitive. So, how do I go back? I don't. This is great. Ah, here we go. Sorry. So, um, this is Steve Hasenplak in the middle in the orange shirt with uh, some of his friends, uh, also adult fans, who uh, helped create a 
gigantic monster chess. It's a chess board uh, that's approximately 4 by 4 meters. It has 38 pieces, not just 30, uh, 36, but 38 because it needs some extra, or 32. It needs some extra pieces when you exchange some of the pieces for a new queen and stuff. They're very articulated. We are running a video later on again uh, just to, to show what they can do. But it took them the better of five months to make this and 300,000 pieces of Lego. We helped them supply some of these because it runs with these 38 uh, microprocessors to, uh, to run the whole, uh, to run each of the uh, pieces. And it can actually play chess. And you can play uh, man against the computer, you can play man against man through a computer or let the computer actually run a game for, by itself. Uh, and you will see in the video that we'll show later how uh, articulate it really is. Um, so running a community is um, like trying to herd a group of wild horses. I have some of my friends here who are actually part of the community and they're also part of the picture here. Um, what we tend to do is meet as often as we can, usually at some of the uh, LEGO fan events that are happening out there in the world and the bigger group we can, we can uh, get together at the same time the better because we share ideas with these guys, we ask them how things are, are going with the, the product uh, if they have new ideas for models or inventions that we can either support or talk about. Um, so this is one of our sessions we had at a very big, actually the biggest uh, fan event in the world called LEGO World, which happens in the Netherlands every year in October. Um, and there's a very huge group of Mindstorms uh, fans that are present, presenting some awesome models. Uh, it's worth a trip uh, if you in, intend to ever go to a fan event. Um, but we're meeting in a restaurant and we are a mix of LEGO people and LEGO fans, um, all wearing the same shirts if we can, and uh, as such talk about uh, crazy stuff. So I call the group here the MCP, it stands for Mindstorms Community mm -hmm. Partners, which is a group that we formed uh, with the same uh, uh, because of our development uh, of the NXT generation, we started forming a little uh, closed group of people that helped us develop the new things. And that has expanded and become a very large group now. Uh, they all uh, have signed an NDA, uh, a non-disclosure agreement, meaning they are working with us in, in confidence. So we share new ideas with them years ahead of time uh, and get their feedback on it. Um, so, some of the things that has come from the community, as I started saying, I am the manager of the community, but the community is kind of running itself. Uh, I'm just trying to see if I can navigate in that big sea of people who have all these crazy ideas and are creating tons of stuff. They're writing books. None of these books have been endorsed or commissioned by LEGO. We just acknowledge that the book's been written about LEGO Mindstorms. And it is the product from LEGO that has been that where there's, we've seen the most books been written about. Uh, so since 1998, more than 65 books have come out. Um, many of them are like LEGO Mindstorms for Dummies to help anyone who needs to get into the, the products. Or they can be very specific and talk about some sophisticated programming environment like other Java or something else. Um, because of the hackers back in the late 90s who uh, took our product apart, we've seen many of uh, new pro programming languages uh, environment being adapted to our system. Um, so there are tons of apps, also apps for smart devices like uh, phones, both Android and for uh, iPhones, uh, that can work with like Mindstorm. Tons of hardware accessories made by third parties, meaning not made by Lego, but made by smaller companies who had the, who were working with technology anyway. And again, uh, in our display in here, we can see some of the, the units out there that are made by, by some of these companies. We have um, some official licensees who are working with the company. They're using our plastic, but they're putting their own technology in it. Um, because we uh, recognized that there was a need for people to, to buy those alternative sensors that we uh, could not bear to actually uh, develop because the market would be too small for us. Um, and there are tons of blogs out there and websites writing about LEGO Mindstorms and putting up posts every day. Uh, Vive Le Robots, who have organized this uh, Café Neuermanns uh, here in Prague, are also showing things about LEGO Mindstorms uh, once in a while, which is quite cool. Um, so, 
I would move on because we have also received a lot of awards. I have to be very humble about Lake Mindstorms because I'm only part of the whole experience, but I'm very proud of, of being part of it because it is one of the most successful uh, sub-brands from Lego, uh, not just with the sales in that we, what we made, but also because we're making robots, which is quite a venture for a company that usually just makes plastic toys for children. We're also now making toys that appeal to children of all ages, meaning adults. Uh, and in the course of the years, we have received a lot of awards for our achievements, both for design, for best technology toy and much else. And one of the best things we uh, actually uh, got to do was we become part of the Carnegie Mellon, which is University of US, uh, USA, uh, their ro Robot Hall of Fame, where they take in real-life robots or robotic construction kits like ours and they take fictitious robots like uh, Commander Data from Star Trek or R2-D2 from Star Wars. Uh, so we are in, in that firmament with these stars out there. We also have our product. Uh, and a little story I can tell about that, uh, that the actual uh, recognition uh, were given at a uh, a robot conference called uh, Robot Business in Boston in 2008. I was there with a colleague. We were in a meeting talking to people about some new technologies we want to adapt and came out of the meeting everyone said, oh you're from Lego, congratulations! And we didn't know what it was all about but got told that we actually got this award which was quite uh, quite cool. Uh, so we're still uh, happy about it uh, but wish we could have really taken it in. But it's, uh, it's, it's one of the um, as part of my presentation here, I want to tell some stories of some of the experiences uh, I've had with some of the uh, robotics inventor inventors out there. Uh, I have talked a little about the company, but as a community manager, what is actually the best uh, for me to talk about is what our uh, users out there have made. Uh, and it's quite impressive what some of these people are doing. And what I also want to factor in here or have in our presentation is that there is time to ask questions. If any of you have a question while I'm running my presentation here, raise a hand or shout out or make some other uh, gest gesture, gesture and uh, I'll try to, to answer whatever question you have. Otherwise, if you can wait until I'm done, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Um, because some of the things I want to talk about is uh, some of the places that LEGO Mindstorms has gone, uh, not just through people, but also in, in the world um, I started the picture, my first picture was one of our robots in Egypt in front of the pyramids. We've done a, uh, a global road trip where we send two robots around the world and then people pass it on from country to country and take pictures in front of uh, some nice landmarks to uh, make it really cool. Uh, based on what people are doing on YouTube today where they show that they've been to 100 countries and doing a crazy dance or something like that. We did the same with our robots. Um, but this gentleman here is uh, Eric, Eric Wang from the University of Reno in Nevada. Um, and he is, like many other adults, uh, a LEGO fan. Um, and works uh, under a NASA grant with uh, all sorts of uh, experiments. And one of the experiments we found out in, uh, by 2008 was that he works with weather balloons uh, with his students and send them up high up into the upper edge of the atmosphere where it's what we call near space. It's the next step would be going into real space uh, to do all sorts of measurements uh, with robots uh, or robotic devices because he's been using Lego Mindstorms to control his camera that he puts on the balloon because naturally when you go up there you want to put a camera on it so you can actually see what goes on. So. Um, when we saw on YouTube that uh, Eric and his students were playing around with Lego Mindstorms robots and putting them under a balloon to control his camera, I got in touch with him and I expressed my interest in what he was doing. Since he was going up to 30 kilometers up in the air uh, into what is near space, I was asking him, so what would actually happen if you dropped something from that uh, height uh, in free fall? Uh, we know that Joseph Kitting Kittinger had done it and uh, Felix Baumgarten had been jumping from balloons from, from that height or even higher than 30 kilometers. So I was thinking about doing something the same because at LEGO we have a very great focus on quality. So we do what we call drop tests. When a child, I'm not going to drop the mouse here, but when a child sits at a, a kitchen table at 
whatever 90 centimeters high and pushes or her Lego model down on the floor, what happens? We need to know that. So we test the strength of our bricks. So the best thing for me would be to say, can we drop something from 30 kilometers up and see what happens? So I asked Eric about that and um, over the phone, and he said, yeah, maybe not, uh, because it's going to be dangerous. What if we kind of control this thing and it lands on something? He does it in the uh, Nevada desert, so we might hit an animal, uh, maybe uh, an electrical mast or something like that. But other than that, uh, maybe it could be dangerous if we didn't put a uh, parachute on it. So I said to Eric, that would be interesting. Uh, still, I would want to see a Mindstorms robot being dropped from 30 kilometers up, coming down in a parachute and see what happens. Um, so we expanded uh, our uh, idea and project to what is now called the HAIL project. Uh, Eric came up with the name, the High Altitude Lego Extravaganza. And we invited uh, some selected people to submit some robots that we could strap onto these balloons and uh, do uh, certain experiments. We invited uh, some children, some school classes, fourth graders from the US. Uh, we had a team from Luxembourg uh, and some other students around the world. Uh, we had a, one of our adult fans who was also a professor of physics uh, wanting to do an experiment and he actually took up the idea of he wanted to drop his robot from up there and see what happened and measure the acceleration whole thing and let the parachute actually fold out and let it land safely in Nevada, in the desert. Well, um, these are pictures from the, uh, the actual, uh, the actual uh, project uh, taking place in Nevada in the desert. And what a robot does, or what, sorry, what a balloon does, it flies over the cloud lane, just disappears and comes into uh, up to the, the, the higher stratosphere and starts seeing the curvature of the Earth when you got the cameras on. Uh, but basically, it's just a, a, a camera that re you know revolves. It goes up and up and up in a spiral until down at the corner here you see the balloon, balloon actually bursts because it expands to uh, such a big size that it cannot contain itself anymore and just bursts. It means the thing comes down again. Uh, so normally they have parachutes on these uh, things so they don't run the wrong way or they can control the landing in whatever way that so this is just some pictures to actually show the, the sequence of that that the things come back down uh, on that day on the 29th of july 2008 they set up two balloons and on one of the balloons we had uh, uh, mr brian davis's uh, robot that was supposed to come down with a parachute well it actually did come down it was packed in styrofoam but um, as you can see, the parachute, that was how it actually looked when it came down. It did not unfold. It meant that we had a robot that uh, were uh, dropped from 27 kilometers up and came down uh, and hit the uh, desert in Nevada with a speed of 50 kilometers an hour, which was uh, quite high for a Lego product. We don't normally do that. Uh, but the robot and the uh, microcontroller survived. Uh, so we call it now the ultimate drop test. Uh, because not even IKEA does this with their things. So um, we were quite proud of having achieved that and actually sent robots nearly into space. Uh, I would like to add that we have uh, been into space. We've been on the space station with our robots. Uh, we are in the space station right now. Cosmonauts and astronauts have the possibility to play with our robots up there and do experiments. We have a website called legospace.com, which is quite easy to remember where we're showing the videos of some of the experiments they do. Uh, and we have in our audience here, Mike from Austria, who also participated in a competition in, was it 2001, Mike? Yes. Uh, where we um, suggested to anyone to come up with an experiment where they could send up a robot uh, into the uh, space station that could help the uh, residents in the, uh, in the space station with some stuff. And uh, there was a German team, actually one, with their invention. Uh, so we have a video somewhere where a couple of uh, cosmonauts are playing around with it. We set it up with the Russians because the Americans were too uh, afraid of uh, the hazards of sending up uh, Lego pieces into space and back then. Uh, but the story goes that uh, a, a good friend uh, used to, uh, was an ex-astronaut, uh, um, took up one, a little Mindstorms robot uh, in his own consignment on his, on his back uh, in uh, 99, 
I actually got to, it was my first programming job, was to program his robot going to space, so it was quite cool. So we've been up there a few times, uh, officially and unofficially. A lot of American astronauts have been bringing small Lego pieces because their kids wanted them too. I have some pictures, but I'm not allowed to show them because of NASA. Um, anyways, this was one of the stories that it's, it's really amazing how someone can take our Lego robots and take them to much higher altitudes than than anyone else. Um, I'm just happy to have been part of it. I've been happy to see that children could actually conduct experiments uh, through this. Um, anyone can actually do this, but we see that a lot today. Uh, but this was a really cool experiment because of Brian, who wanted to break the mold and see if he could actually drop something from really high up and see what happens. Uh, and it come down with a bang. So another story I want to tell is about Tesca. Um, she is a brilliant young girl. Uh, she's now a young woman. Uh, but we got to meet her some years back. Uh, and the story about her is she started programming at age six, which I would see as being a little unusual, but she is quite talented and very gifted. Um, and, and Tesca belongs to a first Lego League team. The abbreviation is FLL. First Lego League is a robotic competition that uh, runs annually uh, and globally, uh, where teams uh, compete uh, to solve uh, big challenges, uh, world-spanning uh, problems. But they also have some missions to, so they have to, to do a technical presentation about how to solve a specific problem. It could be about climate control. Uh, they also have to build a robot that has to complete a mission on a table. Um, but Tesca is part of a team, a crazy team, called the Flame Breathing uh, Robot Doggies. And um, she is the bright one, she's the programmer in the team. Some of them, I guess, are just pressed for fame, but they're also the builders of robots. But she, she has a very special uh, position. And in an interview, I'm really fond of, of, of seeing uh, what it is that she's been working on, because she works on making artificial intelligence, uh, which we see from sci-fi movies, we hear about it when we hear about robotics, that we can actually make computers or machines think and, and uh, be rational on their own accord. Uh, but Tesca has actually done it with our Lego robots. And I would say before I met her, I didn't even think we could ever achieve that. It is quite amazing. Um, but she has actually made that in, in our uh, programming environment. Our programming environment, called NCG, is designed for children. It should be very intuitive to get into. Uh, but uh, I'm quite sure that we're going to have fun with that. But uh, I'm open now for any kind of questions related to robots. So please shoot. The microprocessors, like, how much is it like when anyone like start like, playing at home? Um, buy the one small box and start programming. How much is a uh, like small thing? How much does it cost yeah. of a product? Um, it depends on where you live because prices fluctuate, of course. But uh, here in the Czech Republic, uh, in one of the stores I've seen, uh, a Mindstorms box uh, goes for 8,000 kroners. Um, and it does, it, it does depend on what your level of, of activity or interest is in it because you would have to expand with other Lego products to build more or build a, something as, as uh, complex as this robot. Um, but you also have to remember it will last you for the like last five or ten years uh, and still be worth uh, playing with. So any other questions? I like to, I like to ask if some uh, adult fans, uh, which is not from your country, it's, uh, develop something, if you, uh, if one of them built something, what you start to produce? Well, we have various options to, to take care of that. Um, so the question about whether adult fans or users can actually give us inputs uh, to the product we might develop, uh, we, do have, we do have a few options. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a website called legokuso.com, which is based on a Japanese system where kuso uh, means I wish, uh, where you can submit ideas and if you get 10,000 votes, we would consider uh, producing it. And we actually have that as a process right now. 
and uh, have made a few successful products uh, that way where people have submitting their ideas and then people have been voting on it and we actually have taken up for review and have produced it. Uh, when it comes to LEGO Mindstorms, uh, yes, well, we take inputs every day from people. Mm -hmm. um, as, as a community manager, I have to say, well, now I'm working directly with the community, but before that I worked as both the design manager, so I was working more on the the forming and the shapes of, of the, the products we made. Uh, I've been a marketing manager, so I had to deal with the business too. But all along, the community has been there giving us input. And I remember as a design manager, which was my first job at LEGO, working with LEGO Mindstorms, when we gave up coming up with new ideas, really, because the inspiration was out there in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's a lot of stories like that that we tell. We get, we get uh, input from users uh, for all sorts of LEGO every day. Thank you. Um, what are the different sensors available for the Mindstorm? When aware? What are the different, like what type of sensors? What are, oh, uh, or that's, that's an older question because there are a lot of sensors out there. The ones that, uh, I guess you can start with ones like the manufacturers and then... Well, I'll be discussing a lot of that sensors okay. later. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You'll well, know all of that. <laughs> yeah. We, we have a very small range of sensors. Uh, mm. The mass is out there and the, the third-party sensors that are either uh, under license from us or non-licensed or non-endorsed by us. So there are literally uh, well, I have seven dozens. of them and I don't have every single sensor out there. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, there are new coming out uh, every, every two months, I would yeah. say. It's, it would be the rate. Uh, and the reason, the reason why we uh, decided uh, to let people become licensees, which is kind of a novel thing for an ordinary product line from Lego, was that in, in during the first generation, what we saw some of our hackers do was they took their own hardware and hollowed out a Lego brick and put hardware inside and made a new Lego piece of hardware, a new hardware, and and it meant that they came up with ideas that we hadn't thought of. When we had to new make the new development for the NXT generation. We had to look at these guys and they said, well, I already made these solutions for you. You just have to make it even better. Uh, so that's what we did. Some of the things that we have in the current product has been made by our users. Um, and uh, it meant that somebody who has started with a kitchen sink and been made a few, made their own piece of hardware, now have a company running with a lot of people making uh, alternative sensors that we wouldn't touch because of the volume would be kind of too small for us to run in production. When do you start having to need more than one uh, um, Mindstorm? Microprocessor? Yeah. Um, it all depends. Uh, I, I think it, it depends on what type of robot you make because some robots can be very simple and meets, does not need a big program to do something complex. Sometimes you need a whole uh, bank of them to... It, it, it depends on the scale of the robot, I would say. It's all about scalability. Anyone else? Uh, Otherwise, I would uh, probably was the fu future 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 plan of developing the firmware inside or the firmware. Uh huh. Uh, yes, I would say that today you can get alternative firmware uh, for the uh, microprocessor mm -hmm. if you so wish. Not made by us, but uh, definitely acknowledged and and. Uh, recognized by us. Um, the firmware is, is being developed in, in together with our software partner, but uh, in some cases uh, the free spirits out there in the community can make some better and faster running firmware. So um, it's available uh, if you want to look for it, I can give you an address afterwards. <laughs> I'll also be discussing some of the alternatives. <laughs> yes. So all your questions will be answered. So any anyone anyone else? <laughs> Otherwise, I would like to thank you all for attending, and um, you can always come back and ask me questions uh, later on if you want to. But this was it. Thank you so much.